Welcome to Adeptus On Air, the show where we examine how individuals and companies make decisions that drive their business and personal success. Each week, we connect with notable professionals who pull back the curtain on the industries that Adeptus has been on the cutting edge of for the last 30 years, including music, sports, and entertainment, as well as new emerging markets. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Adeptus on Air. I am your host again, Mike Kaufman, and today I am joined by Michaela Bradshaw. Michaela, how are you? Doing well. How are you doing, Mike? It is good to talk to you again. Uh, I know we, we chat quite often, but it's good to have a face-to-face -face time with you, so uh, I'm very excited to chat with you. Awesome. So for those of you who might recognize Michaela, know Michaela, not Michaela, Michaela has spent two seasons on Survivor. First, it was Survivor's Millennials versus Gen X, I believe was the first one, correct? Yeah. And then Survivor Game Changers. And then she said that wasn't enough of a challenge. Let's go on the challenge uh, <laughs> in 2021. And she just finished recording the season of the challenge that is set to air in the next couple weeks on CBS. Yeah, so, the Challenge USA. So exciting stuff. So, uh, You've definitely lived a life of a lot more adventure and excitement than uh, most people, myself included. Uh, what gave you the itch to want to add this kind of these kind of activities to your life? Um, I think it kind of fell in my lap a little bit. When I went to college, one of the best things I did was study abroad as a senior. And that mm -hmm. was my first opportunity to just immerse myself in an uncomfortable, different environment, like jump into the unknown. That was back in the MapQuest days. So it's it's like you just got on a plane and figured it out. And I kind of got addicted to that experience a little bit. And when I came back to the U.S., graduated, started working, mm -hmm. there was just something missing. Like I enjoyed my job to a reasonable extent. I had my financial goals that I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. But there was still this desire to be able to have fun and have adventure and do something different. And essentially, three years after graduating, I had paid off my student loans and reached the goals that I wanted with my first job. And I decided I'm going to quit and I'm going to take a year off of work. And during this year, I want to open myself up to adventure. And uh, my only restrictions were I had to get a job in a year and a half from the day that I quit. Mm -hmm. I had to come back with more money than I left with. And I had to do something fun and crazy that I couldn't do if I had kids or debt. So um, that was- Did you meet all three of those? I did. I ended up right. on Survivor and I started <laughs> working literally a year and a half from the month that I quit uh, into the career field I'm in now. But that, that kind of manifestation of being open but also knowing, like, I want something different. I like adventure, but I want that balance of real world mm -hmm. and chaos. That's kind of what got me into um, these competition shows. And I, I assume you were a fan of these before you went on? So that's the funny thing. I didn't really watch Survivor. I've never been a big TV head at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I had seen, like, Amazing Race, and I actually thought Amazing Race would be something I'd be interested in because I knew I wanted to travel again. Yeah. But... Survivor, uh, when they approached me about that, I was like, what is that? What, what, what do I need to do? And they got me when they said you can win a million dollars. So that's what I went into it thinking, like you just yeah. don't eat and you live outside. And if you do it long enough, you get a million dollars. I learned a lot that first season. Um, but Now, where was the first season? Where did you film? Uh, first season was in Fiji. Both of my seasons actually were in Fiji. Okay. Same place, same island, different part of the island or? Um... I mean, we flew into the same airport. I don't know. And we had Ponderosa at the same place, but <laughs> I don't know where we stayed relative to where gotcha. we stayed the first time. So so it's interesting because I've gone back and watched clips and, you know, full disclosure, not a big Survivor fan. I watched season one a long time ago. You were, I don't even know if you were born. So I remember watching season one and then watch it here and there. My I've gotten into the challenge the last couple of years watching it with my daughters. So my daughter recently sent me some clips of you mm -hmm. on uh, from YouTube, from your survivor time. And you're very feisty. And is your, 
on-screen persona who you are in real life or is it just the environment or do you are you aware of the fact that you're on tv and you're trying to be a little different no i'm i'm 100 percent myself i mm -hmm. think the, the the feistiness of survivor was michaela in her early 20s you know yeah. and the chillness of now like people will see on the challenge that's michaela in her 30s but the thing that i've really enjoyed about this experience of being on reality tv it's it's been a window into me like you don't really get to step outside of yourself and observe yeah. yourself so i've really appreciated the opportunity to like intellectually know what went on because i was there but then be able to step outside of it watch it on screen and learn something about myself but i think i you know, I'm a genuine, authentic person. So the emotions that I show yeah. on screen are the same emotions that I have. But I got to imagine in that situation, the emotions are probably, you're a little more sensitive to them for a, probably a lot of reasons. One, you're probably hungry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're probably fatigued. You're probably, you know, stressed. You're probably malnourished, maybe a tad dehydrated. So I imagine it's probably harder to keep all those emotions and feistiness in check. Would that be well, fair to say? Well, see, the way I think of it is like, you are who you are. Mm -hmm. And when you're squeezed, like what's inside comes out. So <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. It's just, it's just you are who you yeah. are. And you're just uh, operating in the context of the environment you're in and the things that you're experiencing. But yeah, you know, there are some people who in regular life, they present one way and then on screen, yeah. they look completely crazy. Mm -hmm. The way I view those people is they are genuinely completely crazy and they just <laughs> adapt to what is appropriate yeah. in real life. Um, and then you have some people that, you know, their responses and reactions on a TV show are within the norm, you yeah. know? Um, so I do think, you know, yeah, some things can be more sensitive. Like you're more likely to get irritated if you're hungry like you're more mm. likely to cry you know i remember I, I just broke down bawling when i saw my mom because i was in an absence of love for so long you know sure. um sure. but i also think that every experience in life is cumulative so mm. now i am liable to cry over a lot of things but I, mean, I think that's because of the depth of like emotional impact that survivor had on me at the same time there's a lot of things that don't phase me at all and it's because i've lost a million dollars twice <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> so i you know i think i think at the end of the day people are people and what they express is some version of themselves but well yeah because i think life experiences i mean now if i watch a commercial or a movie now that involves a dad and a daughter i tear up because i have that relationship with with, yeah. with, with my two daughters or 20 years ago, I'm like, that's a stupid commercial. And yeah. I, you know, I'd be, I'd be laughing at it. And now, now it totally sad. pulls its strings because it, it, it's it's relatable. Yeah, so, it has a meaning to you. So one thing I've always wondered about these shows, and I've talked to people who have been on, you know, Big Brother. So it's a similar concept, but obviously outdoor versus indoors. You know, I like to call Big Brother indoor survivor. Mm -hmm. uh, but I got to believe paranoia, you know, and the mind games that could happen to someone that you really have to be very strong minded so not only do you have to be good at, but as they call it, the social game and the physical challenges, but I think someone who is mentally strong, even before they get into there, and I think self-confident. So yeah. all the times I've talked to you, we don't really talk your reality aspect. We talk more about other things in your life, which we'll get to later on. You know, you've always come across a very confident person. So have you been confident kind of all your life? And did that help you in the game, just being confident in yourself? Yeah, I, I would say confidence is a character trait for me. Uh, I think that's a combination of being raised in an environment that was positive and then also like my relationship with God just lets me know who I am. But um, I definitely feel like it was a helpful part of the experience in Survivor and beyond, like deeper than the confidence, it's like the grit and the tenacity that comes with it. Um, and the simple decisions that you can make and stay firm with, like, I'm going to do this and mm -hmm. I'm going to give it my best every day, regardless of how uncomfortable it feels. Um, I think that definitely helped. Um, but at the same time, like 
survivor can can really shatter your confidence because mm-hmm. if you're used to navigating through life in a certain way, having a certain level of success, being able to control your outcomes based on the inputs, and then you're blindsided, <laughs> um, that yeah. and, then, and then you just leave the game. Like it's like it's, there's no there's no recourse, there's no closure. Yeah, it's just I thought that I had a solid foundation. I realized in one moment I don't, and now my dream is like gone. that. It's over. You know, like that shatters people. Yeah. Um, and so I went through that feeling um, of just being uncertain about myself mm-hmm. because I didn't understand what went on, didn't have the opportunity for closure. Yeah. Um, and then so how do you get that closure on something like that? Because, you know, obviously people are talking behind your back and things like that. And obviously at some point you get surprised. And how do you get that closure when you don't really know what happened and you'll say, I'll go back and watch the show. But in the situation like Survivor, you're taping about a year or so plus in advance. Is that correct? Whereas the challenge is much more real time, for lack of a better word. Yeah. So that year where you're waiting to find out exactly what happened and what went wrong, Mm -hmm. that's got to be a tough time to process it without really getting a lot of answers well see the trick is if you make if you make it to the jury you're going to get your answers Mm -hmm. because everybody is going to have a story every time they get put on the jury right every every time somebody gets voted out you're going to collect a little piece of the pie and then um you know you'll have the whole rest of the time there will be a lot of conversations and text message threads behind the scene between when the jury gets flown home and when the show finally airs. The problem is if you don't make the jury, all the people that voted you out, you'll never see them again. You don't have their numbers and you (laughs) have to wait until a group text forms or somebody hits you up on Instagram. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's typically how normally you can piece together some things in that window between when everybody is flown back home and when the show starts airing, but then you don't trust these people. So then you want to see like, well, well that's my point. What is comes on? <laughs> some of these people potentially could have backstabbed you as part of the game. And then yeah. they're the same people that are giving you the story that you're hearing. So again, it's almost like you're still playing the game when you're outside of the game. Now you're not yeah. competing anymore, but you're still trying to piece things together. Piece it together. And, and you, you still know, don't know who's lying to you. You know, what's funny is I think for me playing back to back, I learned to just, not need all that information. I don't need right. to know what. I need to know that. I don't need to know why. I yeah. need to know that. And and that shift in perspective that keeps me from having to dig and figure out all the pieces, it gives me um, a level of peace with things now. Mm-hmm. And it also just heightened my awareness of what to pay attention to. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I walked away from that survivor experience with clinically diagnosed hyper awareness and uh, you know initially it was just a huge trigger for anxiety but now that i've learned to adjust to it and leverage it as like a skill it's my superpower like i can walk into a room and people what's going on and i've learned like don't freak out about it just operate appropriately like adjust as i need to and keep it going and and now it's my it's a skill that i leverage at work um, when I, you know, play these other games, when mm-hmm. I navigate relationships and people, I mean, it, it works for me. So, yeah. Now, it was interesting. You just made a comment before. And I think what I'm about to say is accurate, but I know you, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. So you were back to back seasons, which means when you filmed the second season, no one had seen your first season yet. So you kind of came in as an unknown where Correct. you were playing with people who you had already kind of studied their games, having watched them played potentially. Correct. Well, I didn't know who the people were going to be on the show. Right. But, but you I, but you, you, might have been familiar with some of them where they all basically yeah. had no idea who you were. Exactly. They thought I was Jatia, the person that threw the rice in the, in okay. the, in the sand. And I was like, <laughs> no, that's not me. <laughs> wrong, wrong one. Um, but yeah, that, that definitely was a thing. And that, that impacted my standing with people, you know, at the beginning of Game Changers because it's, it's better the devil you know than the devil you don't. And that's for right. everybody there except Zeke who was on a different tribe. I was the, mm-hmm. I was the person they didn't know. Right. Um, so that's good and bad. You don't come with, Oh my God, this person's a backstabber, but you also don't go with, okay, 
I can work with this person. Them. Exactly. Yeah. You just yeah, so you, you're, you're always expendable. Yeah, no, no, exactly right. So I was telling you earlier, so this is kind of why I asked the confidence question before, because the one clip that I saw as recently as last night was it's labeled on YouTube, the JT blindside. <laughs> and it was a tribal council. And obviously him and I guess his, what I'll call group thought you were going home and clearly he was surprised by it. But what I found so remarkable about you was just how calm you were and your facial expressions and you knew what was going down. Now, in that situation, because I don't really want to talk specifics of a game, because if you don't watch that season, that conversation is boring to you. Even though you're confident that what's about to happen is about to happen, are you still going crazy in your mind thinking, wait a minute, am I about to be blindsided like I think I'm about to do to him? Or are you literally as calm, cool, and collected as you appear to be? I was calm, cool, and collected in terms of my confidence that the votes were going to go the way mm -hmm. I expected them to, but I was brimming inside with so much emotion and anger and frustration mm -hmm. um, in that moment. And for me, the way I had to play game changers was because I was on the fringe with everyone. Um, I had to keep my cards close to my chest. I had to gather information, not tell anyone that I had it and maneuver accordingly. Um, my goal was to keep myself being as minimal of a threat as possible. And so I was always riding the bottom, right? If something went wrong, it was me. But one thing that I learned from my first season is how to assess my gut feeling, right? So I had a gut feeling the day I went into tribal council and millennials Gen X and went home. I just had never experienced it before. Mm -hmm. So anytime in Game Changers, I went into tribal council and I didn't have that exact same feeling. I took that as I'm safe today, proceed mm -hmm. with the plan. So I was very confident of what was going on with JT. I did not want to say too much to give away anything before the votes got cast, but I wanted to make sure that he knew on his way mm -hmm. out that I knew. And my way of doing that all throughout the different tribal councils and game changers was doing something nonverbal, whether it was eating popcorn, mm -hmm. sipping tea, swinging. Tea. Or, yeah, it was, and I told Jeff, like, this is not to be sassy. Yeah. This yeah. is to quietly convey mm -hmm. that you thought you had me and I had you without yeah. giving myself away. And so that's that has become a staple of how I play mm -hmm. the game. So with any of these games, you get beat by someone or you beat someone either way. How does the personal relationship with that person afterwards, is it easy for you? I'll ask it two ways. Is it easier <laughs> for you to forgive someone who outplayed you because, Hey, they beat me. Or if you didn't like how it went down, yeah, they beat me, but it was kind of sneaky. Yeah. Or is it, Hey, high five. The idea is you lasted longer than me. That's the object of the game. Doesn't matter how you do it. Yeah. So for me personally, I don't have a hater bone in my body. So if you win, you win. Congratulations. It doesn't matter if I like you. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. if I like how you did it. If you won, you won. And I can give someone their flowers. Mm -hmm. Are most people like that? Absolutely not. Most people are butt hurt. Mm -hmm. um, they're upset, particularly when people that they thought that they were controlling or had an advantage over end up, you know, doing something that doesn't advance that person's individual game. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, a lot of people were upset with Sarah Lucina when she won. They voted for her. I was actually a champion for Sarah on the jury, even though she's responsible for sending me home. Mm -hmm. But it's like, of the people that are left, y'all know she played the best game. And all of you know that you thought you had Sarah in your pockets, because I heard you say it all game. And right. she individually orchestrated each of your ousters, right? Mm -hmm. So those people, they voted for Sarah in the moment, but most of them don't like her at all right. Right. <laughs> to date. Uh, and it's because their egos are bruised um, or they just never liked it to begin with and were pretending in the game and then don't have to pretend now because the money's yeah. already paid. So, yeah. yeah, for me, it's not a problem. But for a lot of people, it, it definitely hurts their feelings. Yeah, I, I, I think with any of these things, and, and, and it equates to real life too, in, in, in a corporate world or so forth, Sometimes you got to hide what you're feeling. Yeah. It's, it's no Money different than me. If I, yeah. If I'm frustrated with one of my staff people or they're frustrated with me, more so, you can't, 
you know, you can't talk back to a boss, that kind of thing. Uh, and you always see, well, you typically see on these shows, it's the person who loses their cool or can't handle something that usually are kind of short lived, but it's the even keel people. And I think it's actually pretty reflective, like I said, of life in general, you know, being even keeled, kind of go with the flow, you know, not getting too high, not getting too low. Yeah, agree. I'm getting so, better at even keel. <laughs> so how does, uh, so now you do the challenge and, yeah. you know, ha ha from an experience standpoint, which did you find to be, I don't want to use the word challenging because that's kind of defeats <laughs> the purpose with the name of the show. In terms of you and your temperament and your skill set, which one did you find to be more of a challenge? So that one's a little hard to answer. So Survivor gave me a baseline, right? Mm -hmm. The challenge is completely different. The people on the challenge, particularly the MTV version of the challenge, they move in a different way. Um, one, because most of them have been on reality TV shows since they were children, mm -hmm. like in their right. teens or early 20s. So that's the frame of reference they're coming from. They're not mm -hmm. like professional sure. people with careers, right? So you have that one. And then because they go on show after show after show, there's this depth of relationships that impact their gameplay um, that you can't really penetrate because you don't have that relationship. In Survivor, mm -hmm. for the most part, most people don't know each other. It's very yeah. rare that people play twice, mm -hmm. um, you know. But in the challenge, you have people that have been playing the game together for five, six, seven years, right? right. So those dynamics, just the backgrounds of the people, um, the fact that they have played with each other and the fact that they are playing to get cast again, not mm -hmm. just to win. Right. So um, they have to build, they have to make themselves watchable. Yeah. Entertaining. Yeah. And, and so forth. So, you know, they want to have them back. And, 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 and as you said before, there are some people that are probably, cause the challenge has been on the MTV version, 30 something seasons. Am yeah. I correct with that? Yeah. They're at 40 now. So at 40. So you probably have some of them who are on double digit seasons and I don't think I'm probably exaggerating. Exactly. There. Exactly. And they come from real world and road rules and this mm -hmm. dating show and that. So it's yeah. a different population of people that move in a different way. Th that aspect of the challenge was the most disruptive thing for me mm -hmm. because there was literally a, sh a shift, you know, um, in Survivor, you're not allowed to talk to anybody until the game starts. That means we see each other for up to seven days and there are no words shared. Mm -hmm. In the challenge, you can mix and mingle beginning at the airport. People, you know, stay in the hotels. They talk across the balconies. There's all of this co-mingling going on. Mm -hmm. But then as soon as you step into the house, the game starts and people turn into game mode, right? Right. So it's just a... That element of the game threw me off. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't adapt to it very well my first season of the challenge, and I went home first. Mm -hmm. And we won't speak about the second season, which is a couple of weeks away from airing. A couple of weeks from airing, but I can tell you, I always do things differently. I'm a quick study. There you go. Well, so. it wouldn't do you much good to not have had success the first time and not said, hey, I got to <laughs> I gotta change some things up here a little bit. Yeah, the bar was set so low the first time. It's you know. Hey, listen, I don't know what happened, but as long as you didn't go home first, you did a lot better yeah. than you did the first time. That's that's always step number one. Don't go. home. So you know what's going to upset me now? <laughs> when I what? watch this in a few weeks, if you go home the first week, I'll be like, damn it, why did I say that? See, now you know? I'm gonna I'm setting myself to get for you to be pissed off at me in a few weeks when you call me and said, you see what you said? There you go. Look, hey, all you all I can do is my best. I used to have a boss. That's that right. Said, yeah. All you can do is your best. So. Yeah, that, that's all you can do. So, all right. So now you've done four seasons of reality TV. And in between, you had, as your previous deal was with yourself, you got back into the workforce. But obviously, every time you kind of go on a show, you have to kind of make some arrangements with your employer or things like that because you're gone for an extended period of time. So now that you're back from the challenge, uh, what are you doing now? Um, so now I'm back working in program management. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I first came back from Survivor, I went into human resources. And then a couple years ago, I 
kind of pivoted into program management. So now I'm doing that at a cool company that was so gracious to let me step away for a little mm-hmm. bit. And um, yeah, I work a nice little nine to five. I work from home and I enjoy my life. Good. Well, that's the important thing. Life isn't just about work. Life's about all, all these other things. So since this is an accounting podcast, one of the things I kind of like to ask, especially with clients of mine, is, you know, we've been together now, you know, a little over a year. Uh, you were referred over by another reality uh, person <laughs> who, you know, I, I work with and that you've met through through the reality family. Uh, what to you, what's important about a relationship with what I'll call a business advisor or an accountant? Uh, I think most important is trust. Um, It can be difficult to, well, let me lay this out. I think it's trust, expertise, and communication, really. Mm -hmm. So trust, you know, there are things that I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, doing things like, being on a reality TV show and getting an extra check, you know, or buying an investment property and, and trying to figure out what to do about this. Like these are things that are all outside of my realm of understanding. And the fact Mm -hmm. that I go to work every day and have a life means that I don't necessarily have hours and hours and hours to dedicate towards Mm -hmm. figuring out the best thing to do. So just knowing that there's someone who has the expertise to get a good read on my situation, know what questions to ask me to do the best mm-hmm. work for me, um, to somebody that I can trust to operate with integrity that's not going to try to take advantage of me um, or, you know, do something that's ultimately detrimental to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then three, someone that communicates, that can that can be the expert, but also can help me understand what's going on so that that trust can be built. And so that I can Mm -hmm. feel comfortable with what's happening. Those are the three things that are most important to me. So the the trust, the expertise and and the communication. Man, I don't have any of those. That's not a good sign. Oh, I do. Okay. Thank God. All right. Fine. I was worried for a second. Well, the trust definitely takes time with any relationship. So both professionally and not. So the trust is, you know, I can say you can trust me, but the people that say you can trust me are probably the people you can't trust. Yeah. So it's uh, that definitely comes with time. And like anything, and I'm sure you experience it in both your personal and your professional life, you know, communication to anything is the key. So, you know, you, you helping you understand or, you know, helping you know what to ask or pivoting you in the right way based upon what your objectives are. Uh you know, I read, I read somewhere, it might've been one of these little silly reality interviews you were doing before you went on. It talked about what are your objectives in life, not reality show objectives. And you said you want to pass down money and it wasn't even to your children. It was to your grandchildren. Yeah. Which is a great, most people don't say that. It's, you know, I want to leave money, you know, I want to live nice. If I can leave some money to my kids, that's great. But you even took that one step further and you said you wanted to kind of leave it two generations down. Yeah. So yeah. what's your five to 10 year plan right now professionally? And like, how would you like to see the next, you know, portion of your life go? You still open to TV opportunities? Are you going to try and build your professional career? You had mentioned some, uh, you know, real estate investing and things like that. Like what excites you about, you know, how your life might go in the next several years? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'll start off by saying like, a, a wise man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. That's like a proverb, proverb 13 mm-hmm. and something. And so I, I've i grown up thinking that my time on earth is supposed to create a lasting impact, like mm-hmm. not just financially, but otherwise as well. Yeah. Um, and so for me, when I think of where I am at life right now in the next five years, you know, relationship is a priority for me. Mm-hmm. I've done a lot of things, achieved a lot on my own. Mm-hmm. Um, and having someone to do life with mm-hmm. is a key to my fulfillment personally. Mm-hmm. Um, also, you know, in order to leave an inheritance to my grandkids, I have to have 
some kids uh, <laughs> there's a timeline on that so um that that's a that's a focus for me so like career yeah. wise i guess I, that is the first step in that process i would you imagine know, you know like you have to you have to put your ducks in order right but then you also <laughs> have to know when to pivot and be like okay you know like my, my, Compound interest is going to compound, right? Like if you have money to buy into yeah. an investment, it's a press mm -hmm. of a button or yeah. a phone call, right? Mm -hmm. But relationships um, are the currency of life and those take time to build and those have windows of opportunity to them. So when I think about my next five years, like I would love to continue the progress I have right now. I'm not really focused on moving up in terms of career. I'm mm -hmm. okay to stay in this general area that I am. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a lot of power in um, coming together. So if, if or when I have a partner that I want to do life with and we come together, well, whatever his assets are and whatever my assets are, just by nature of them coming together, that's going to create exponential growth. And mm -hmm. then I can position or reposition myself from focusing on all my things to focusing on a component of our things. Um, so I just think there's, I'm excited for the synergy of placing everything that I've built and worked for with someone else who's aligned on values and all these other things, and then kind of going into this next phase of life together. Now, if that doesn't happen, I'll just pick up, move to another country and practice global arbitrage. I'll be making my U.S. dollars at go. my nice, comfortable job. And I'll live in Kenya or Ghana or somewhere else where I'm rich. And I'm just going to be a rich auntie and have a uh, support and orphanage. <laughs> oh, I, well, I was going to make you a generous offer that if you ultimately don't have grandkids, and I do, I will be more than willing to allow you to leave all of your your wealth to my kids. So they, I will consider that. Yeah, I will consider so the, that. The, it, this offer is recorded. It's documented, and it's something we can revisit in like you know twenty thirty years if we need to. There we go. I'll make a trust. You know, we can there set you go. things up. Hey, I can I can do the accounting for the trust. You see how this is coming <laughs> together like so nicely. So I, I think I think this is awesome. So mm -hmm. as the challenge is going to come to an end, you know, obviously the airing in, in like probably. What's it on? Is it like an eight week run on TV or 10 week run? Something like yeah, that? Yeah, something I heard is going to end in October. Okay. So probably a little longer than that. So are, do any opportunities afford themselves to you in terms of what I'll call, for lack of a better word, the 15 minutes that kind of, you know, 15 minutes of fame that kind of come off of one of these shows? Is there anything there that you're able to leverage, uh, yeah. you know, until as, you know, until the next season comes about and there's a new cast of characters? Well, I I've actually talked to some of my cast members about that because a lot of people do it. They make the money on social media. They have mm -hmm. brand things. I'm a private person. Like mm -hmm. I, 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 th those opportunities are available. I don't take advantage of them. I would love, you know, if there is a gym in Dallas, Texas or a personal trainer, use me. You can take all the videos you want. I would like, you know, I don't need an exchange of money. Just what's a service that I already need yeah. or have. Train me. Yeah. yeah. Just train me and take your pictures and don't tag me all you want to, but I'm not going to do it for you. Yeah, I, yeah, just, yeah. I want the free exercise. Like that's what I want. Dallas Mavericks, Dallas Cowboys. Just let me come to the game and watch in a suite. Like if you need me to hold a microphone and say something, I will. But those are the little things I want. But I, other than that, I don't have the desire to, you know, just be posting things on the internet yeah. and talk about different products that I may or may not use. Well, that's I, exactly where I was going with it. You know, <laughs> where, you, where you see is a lot of reality people. It's exactly what you yeah. see. You know, it'll say paid partnership with, you know, X, whether it's yeah. a drink or a clothesline or a, you know, a mail product or something like that. And, you know, yeah. That's not just not thing. my style, but I would, I would do things like panels, like talking about something worthwhile. I love right. connecting people with useful information. Um, I'm happy to share stories that are meaningful to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but outside of, outside of a useful exchange, like 
personal training, food, yeah. uh, sporting events, or something that is like connected to a passion of mine, like communicating information, connecting with people. I, I don't see myself. I'm going to go, I'm going to take a shot in the dark here. And something tells me you would not have a tough time cutting a deal with a trainer for <laughs> some posting. You know, I probably wouldn't. I just have to ask. I think that's something that should be, as you say, you like to get out of your comfort zone and you like to try new things. Yeah. That should be your goal. When th- when this gets on, you should get yourself some, uh, you should get yourself some free training. Why not? Okay, I know, I know a guy that owns the gym. Okay, that's gonna you. be, that's gonna be, and he po- he's a great poster. He posts things all the time, and there's a lot of like athletic former athletes that go to his. All you gotta do is you share what he posts. You share it on your story. Now you have all of your people watching it. Boom, done. It works for him. One post. Okay, okay. That I'll 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 do that. I'll reach out to him today and I'll say, Mike challenged Mike me to ask. That's right. That's right. So. That is your challenge. See, we, unfortunately, we keep coming back to that word challenge. That is the theme of this conversation. I don't know why. That's the theme of life, man. It's a new challenge every day. Right. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great name. That should be the name of a show. Oh, wait a minute. Never mind. It is. Okay. But uh, yeah. So listen, it's uh, it's been fun talking to you. Uh, I'm glad we got to do this. It's been a pleasure working with you, you know, the past year. I'm looking forward to, you know, continuing doing that. And uh, when does the show uh, premiere? The show airs August 10th on Thursday um, in just a couple of weeks. I think it's like at nine or 10 o'clock. PM, so it'll be on CBS and it'll be tons of fun. So don't miss it. All right. It. Well, my goal is to be watching it week two and still seeing you. All right. No promises. No promises. I know you can't say anything. I'm not asking for any information, but I want to see you in week two. If and nothing else, you'll see me on a recap. That's right. That's right. But here's what's going to happen I am going to text you. As soon as week one ends, I am going to text you and I'm going to say, thank goodness. <laughs> or right. now you got to do it a third time. So yeah, <laughs> you're going to get one of those texts from me as soon as that show ends. <laughs> awesome. I'll take it. I'll wait for it with the gift right. ready. You got it. So again, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. It's been a pleasure and uh, best of luck, not only on the season, but in all that you do. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Adeptus On Air. If you like this episode, please subscribe and leave a review. If you have a question related to this episode or have a request for what you would like to hear, please email us at marketing at adeptuscpas.com. You can also find us at adeptuscpas.com online or follow us at Adeptus on social media. The views and opinions by the podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Adeptus. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice.